Good evening. If you guys have your Bible, go ahead and open up to the book of John, chapter 15. We are just continuing with our first by verse study through the book of John and encourage you to not only join us with us on Wednesdays, but on Sunday mornings. It's been absolutely amazing. So uh, it's encouraged to follow along, read ahead. But tonight is a special night. We got a couple things going on. Uh, we have a baptism at the end of our service. I hope you guys are excited about that. We get to celebrate and rejoice with so many. They're going to make that public profession of faith, the amazing things that God has done in their hearts and their lives. If you're in here tonight and you're going to get baptized, would you just stand up? We just want to celebrate. Get a little early celebration, a little sneak peek right now. Yeah. Yeah, you guys can be seated. These are the men and women who've been training, can hold their breath five minutes, and we're going to see what that looks like in a little bit. So, yeah, we're so excited for you guys. I want to encourage you to stick around with us at the end of the service. We're going to rejoice. We're going to celebrate with them. We're going to do our water baptism a little different this evening. We're going to continue and have a time of worship and incorporate baptism with worship. And so, uh, we're going to be able to celebrate with them. We're going to have worship going on. It's just going to be a sweet, sweet time. And so, man, be here, be present, celebrate. Celebrate, rejoice. So often we're in such a hurry to get out of here because we have things to worry about tomorrow, things to do, uh, a list that is so long. But man, be here, celebrate, rejoice with those who are going to get baptized. And if that's not enough um, encouragement, at the end we will have a cookie fellowship. And so you got a double whammy, you know, you can stick around. But we, we want a fellowship. Today we had a meal together, we want to worship together, and then have fellowship with those who got baptized. You see somebody who wet and just go up and give them a hug and just God bless them. It's going to be a sweet, sweet, sweet time. So a couple of things tonight. We're going to be looking at John chapter 15 uh, verses 12 through 17. Uh, we're going to pick up and we're going to do a two-part series on relationships. So tonight we're going to look at relationships with each other and then next week we're going to finish chapter 15 and look at relationships with the world. And also we're going to do some special things in the midst of that. Like I said, tonight we're going to have a cookie fellowship. So uh, we got dinner and dessert and then dessert again. Uh, so make sure you guys stick around for the cookie fellowship afterwards. But then next week, if you're sick or you're suffering or you're hurting physically, the pastors, the elders of the church will be available at the end of next week's service to anoint with oil according to the word of God. We've seen miraculous healings take place. And so if you or you know somebody who's sick, suffering, in need of a physical touch from the Lord, make sure you come out next Wednesday in faith, believing that our God can heal. Amen. So just be praying that God's spirit would be here next week and that lives would be touched and we would have just amazing testimony. So that's it for the next couple of weeks. And uh, right now let's jump in. John chapter 15, verse 12, it says this. This is my commandment, that you love one another just as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that one would lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you slaves, for the slave does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all things that I have heard from my father, I have made known to you. And so Jesus, again, the last 24, the last few hours of his life is having these intimate times, these intimate conversations with his disciples. So often it is of the utmost importance, the things that are said at the end of one's life are of lasting value. And that is so true in the life of Jesus. John takes about 75% of his letter and focuses on the final 24 hours of his life. So you can imagine just the wealth of wisdom that we can gain from that. On Sunday morning, we're going to read verses 1 through 11 where he talks about abiding in the vine and how he is the vine. And apart from him, we can do nothing. But as we abide in him and him and us, we can produce much fruit. A very exciting passage that's so applicable for our lives. But in verse 12, he starts by saying, this is my commandments. Now, we're all familiar with the Ten Commandments. Amen? Go ahead and list them. <laughs> Just kidding. It's not going to test. We're, we're familiar with the Ten Commandments. We know them. We know some of them. And we do our best to live by them. We're no longer under the law. But he says the whole law can be summed up in this. Love your neighbor as yourself and love your God with everything. We're not going to 
sin against man if we're loving him as ourselves. And we're not going to sin against God if we're loving him with everything. So all the commandments can be wrapped up in those. But as we see here, this literally could be the 11th commandment. He talks about it often throughout the gospel, especially at the end of his life. He says, this is the commandment that you love one another. Us as Christians, as believers, those who would confess and abide and walk with Christ, we need to get along and love with other brothers. It's often said, I love them, but I do not like them. Amen. (laughs) Some of you guys are thinking about that brother and sister in Christ. Oh man, they've been there to help me grow. No, we need to love them. And hopefully as we love them, pray for them, God would just do an amazing healing and making us like them and drawing us close to each other. I've seen miracles, miraculous things. Those people who you find difficult in your life begin to pray for them. There can be no ill will in your heart whatsoever if you're praying for someone. If you're on your knees laboring and taking that person before the Lord, God will do an amazing work in your hearts. As believers, as Christians, as followers of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we are brothers and sisters in Christ, and we are to love and get along with one another. And this, that very calling to love one another is the chief mark of a disciple. If you're here and you consider yourself a follower, a disciple, a disciplined learner of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the mark, the badge of that very calling that you claim to be is love for each other. Jesus said this, by this they will know you're my disciple. They will know you're a disciple and a follower of Jesus by the way you love each other. Is that the case in your life here tonight? They're not going to know that you love each other by the amount of mission trips that you go on, by the service and the things that you do. They will know by the love that you have for each other. Well, pastor, I'm not a very loving person. I express myself differently. It's not the way I was brought up, a little rough and tough. I show my love in different ways. No, that's the old you. The new you is called to love one another. We truly need to understand the magnitude of this commandment. It's not a suggestion, it's not a request from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, but it says, this is a commandment that you love one another. Jesus' commandment here, when he talks about love and the calling to love and the challenge to love, it has nothing to do with emotion, nothing to do with feelings, but it has to do with choice and will on our parts. To do it when maybe we don't feel it. Maybe there's no emotion behind it. That's not what he's saying. He's saying you need to consciously choose and make an effort, a will to love one another. It's an action. The scriptures, you can search them high and low and from front to back and you will never find a commandment or anything requesting us to feel a certain way. This is what I need you to do. I need you to feel like loving somebody. That, that commandment's not there. It all, every commandment that the Lord gives us, it always invokes action for us to do something. That's what he's doing here. Love one another. This takes an action. This takes a will, effort, conscious decision on my heart. I will love my brothers and sisters in Christ. I will pray and ask God to help me to show that love for my brothers and sisters in Christ. The way that you have demonstrated it. How did he say to demonstrate it? The way that he loved us. Sacrificially. To the point where he gave his life. Lord, help me love my brothers and sisters. Help them to feel that kind of love to know that I would sacrifice for them. That is what you are calling me to do. That you love one another just as I have loved you. As he gives this command, the disciples are now standing up. They are... They have finished the last supper and Jesus said, it's time to go. They are getting ready to begin their final journey together. They're standing in the upper room and he gives them this command. This wasn't the first time that he gave them this commandment in a short period of time. Within this upper room time, he had, within this final sermon, he'd given them this command a couple of times now. Now, this wasn't something that Jesus was forgetting and he was just repeating himself, going over and over, and he would just come back to. He wasn't forgetting, but he was emphasizing the importance of it over and over and over. 
I remember when I was a kid and my parents and my grandparents, they would emphasize points and they would say over and over and they would sound like a broken record. How many of you guys remember that? I find myself saying that now and my kids saying that to me, dad, I know you just told me that. Okay, well, let me just tell you again. Did I really just say that? It's so important. And we need to understand that this is so important to Jesus of the utmost importance to him that we love one another. This is how people will know that we're his disciples. And so he says, and he repeats it again. His command to love was a very timely message for them. It's one for us as well, but for them, in light of everything that they were getting ready to go through, the fact that Jesus was getting ready to leave them, the difficulty that was gonna come upon them, the testing, the trials, the temptation for them would be to turn against each other to begin to fight and for division to take place and pride to, to enter in. As he leaves and pressure comes upon them, we have the temptation to, to, to turn on each other. And Jesus said, no, with everything you're going through, you need to love one another, love one another. And that's hard during difficult times. You can see that on, on sports teams. When sports teams are having a, a rough patch and they begin to lose a, a couple of games, frustration begins to set in. Now the mature people, the captains of the team, if they're not careful and they don't grab that team and say, look guys, we're going to stick together in the face of adversity, what happens is when reporters put microphones in their face, they start playing the blame game. Well, if they would do this, the coach is doing this. They just turn on each other like pit bulls. Pit bulls always get a bad rap. Not like pit bulls. I love pit bulls. But, you know, just to turn on each other. Right? They just go. And that's the temptation that the disciples would be faced with if they weren't careful. So he says, look, do it all. I need you to love one another. So, so important that during his last sermon, his last time with them, he repeats it over and over and over again. You see, my friends, it's not about the amount of theology we know, the amount of wisdom that we have. If we have not love, if we don't really love one another as Christ has loved us, if we don't have that love for the person sitting next to us, look to that person next to you to your left and look to the person next to you to your right. If you don't have that true love, the way that Christ loved us for that person, we are missing the point. Missing it completely. We're to love one another. This is a commandment. He elaborates in verse 13, he says, greater love than this, no one that would have laid down his life for his friends. There are people in our lives that we might say that we love to death. There are people in our lives that we would literally say, I would do anything for. The list is maybe short, but there's those people that we would literally die. We wouldn't think twice about. We would do anything for them. And so Jesus here, he gives us a very clear, a very easy way that we can show and demonstrate that love towards them. Very easy. How do we demonstrate that love? Because we can, we can say that we will do anything for them. Some of you guys are, are married. Some of you guys are sitting next to your siblings. I love you. I would, I would do anything for you. Anything. But how can we demonstrate that? We can show that, as it says right here, by willingly dang, laying down our lives, our needs, our wants, our desires for them. It's very easy, right? You can laugh. Some of you guys are like, this is getting weird. <laughs> That's difficult, right? Uh, to live a life of, of sacrifice, to live a life of literally dying daily to ourselves. That's what Jesus said, greater love than this, no love than this, and one that would lay down his life for his friends. One commentator put it this way. He said, no man can carry his love for his friend farther than this. When he gives up his life, he gives up all that he has. He paraphrased what Jesus said. He said, this proof of my love for you, I shall give you in a few hours. And the doctrine in which I recommend to you, I am going to exemplify myself. What does that look like to laying down one's life, sacrificially loving? Jesus gives us that example. And willingly going to the cross, he literally gave all that he had, not just in death, but in life as well. We see sacrificial love. Times when the Bible would say that they would come to him and he would literally stay up all night healing all those that came to him. Laying down, setting himself aside. 
his wants, his desires for them. Our love should be such that we are willing to die for one another. Jesus gave us the example. Jesus actually took the example a step further and not only dying for his friends or for those that he loved, but even for the whole world. And while yet we were sinners, Christ died. When we were at enmity and enemy of God, he died for us. So he took it a step further. And it's amazing because Jesus never gives or commands us of something he himself didn't demonstrate and show. This is difficult. This is hard. This needs to be something that we pray about because this is a commandment from God. Something that we want to be obedient to. We need to pray that when times of frustration or anger arise within the relationships around us, whether it's our co-workers, our spouses, our children, our children, whatever it may be, other believers, we need to think of this. And we just need to Praise God for the opportunity that he's placed before us to love and to lay down our lives. It's difficult. It's hard. This is hard, but if we do this, I guarantee God will show up. If we're changing our minds and willing to say, God, I'm not going to get frustrated. I'm not going to get upset. I'm not going to get angry. I'm not going to prove my point. I'm going to lay down my life. And this is so difficult. So difficult. It's hard. And it takes a lot of prayer, a lot of self-control. How many of you guys like to get in the last word in argument? Right? Man. Okay. All right, I'll I'll humble myself. And then you just mumble something. (laughs) Lord, thank you for, you know. Or you just walk away and you just, Lord, thank you so much that I have (laughs) self-control. That's not winning. That's not right. Lord, thank you for showing me how to love my husband and not telling him how stupid he is right now. Thank you, Lord. Man, just to be laying down our will, our desires for people around us to truly love one another. This is difficult. We need to pray. We need to pray constantly for this. And he goes on in verse 14. He says, you are my friends if you do what I command. You see, the disciples and us today are friends with God through obedience. There's a big if there. It says, if you do what I command you, we are friends. If you're obedient. Now, notice he doesn't say perfection. It's not, it's not what he, he, he says there. But a heart that desires to be holy and pleasing to God. And when we miss the mark, our hearts are grieved. We don't t- take sin lightly. We don't just cast aside, oh, okay, I'm covered by grace. No, we want to be obedient. We desire to be obedient. We want to be holy as he is holy. We want to be perfect as he is perfect. It says, you are my friends if you do what I command. Now, being a friend of God is a, is a common phrase within the Christian community. We sing songs about it. I am a a friend of God. And it's very general. And if we're not careful, it can desensitize to the reality of what it truly means to be a friend of God. A friend of God, according to Jesus here, it says, you are my friends if you do what I command you. There are many people that would claim to be a friend of God, but they don't do those things at which he says. To those he would say, why do you call me Lord, Lord? Why do you call me friend? You don't do those things which I say. Not only do you not do them, but you don't desire to do them at all. We can't deceive ourselves thinking that we're a friend of God and we're doing everything that our friend abhors and despises. We're not a friend at all. We know what it's like to have a, a close, intimate personal relationship with a friend. Maybe you've had that at one time or you have that now. You would know what a personal friendship, it's so special and so powerful. Those who enjoy that with God are those who are most obedient to him. That's it. You want to be a close, you want, you want to be of the utmost, so close, so intimate and personal with Christ. It says, man, obedience, obedience. We can show him our love we can, and friendship towards him by doing the things that he commands. That's what, he, that's what he's blessed by. Charles Spurgeon said this, it must be active obedience, 
Notice that. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. Some think that it's quite sufficient if they avoid what he forbids. Abstinence from evil is a great part of righteousness, but it is not enough for friendship. And we have to be careful with that because let me repeat that. Abstinence from evil is a great part of righteousness, but it's not enough for friendship. You see, it's much more than not just doing evil things anymore. It's about pursuing and doing what is pleasing as well. You see, when I came to the Lord, I had a lot of things that I needed to stop doing. I was a mess and I had so many issues. And my focus was not doing those things anymore because I knew they were wrong. I knew that I was dead in my sins and trespasses. I needed to stop those things. It's not enough. Those, that's good. I want to encourage you, continue to resist the devil and he will flee. But it's not just stop doing this. It's doing what is pleasing to the Lord. It's two parts. We run away and we run to. And we begin to do those things that are pleasing to God. And so, are you obeying his commands? Are you doing those things? That's what we need to be about. That's what we need to be focusing and not just not doing this and not doing that. As friends, he no longer calls us slaves, but friends. He takes and talks about this new relationship on no longer being slaves, but friends. But interesting, even though he says this, Paul, Jude, Peter, and James, all throughout the New Testament, we see these writers refer to themselves as bond servants, as bond slaves of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so even though we're friends, I think it's important that we remember that we are willing servants, that he is our Lord and our master, and we willingly die to ourselves to follow, submit, and serve him. In doing that, we are friends. That's where it starts. There's no friendship without repentance and obedience. And I was just thinking, man, isn't that just amazing that we are a friend of God? James chapter 2, verse 23 says that Abraham was a friend of God. And with that friendship, he had secrets. God revealed things to him. It's impossible to have a better friend than God. It's absolutely amazing that we can be a friend of God. I was thinking about that. What a, an amazing friend we have in him. And as I was thinking about that and meditating, I couldn't help but think about what kind of friend am I towards him? What kind of friend am I? I began to get convicted a little bit because at times I'm flaky. I'm fickle. I'm, I'm a little unfaithful at times. And I, that's never the case with him. And I just want to be closer to him, more obedient to him. And I see that I can, how I can do that, how I can get closer to him. It's by being obedient to him. And so he says, you're no longer slaves, but you're friends. There's a certain amount of intimacy that came with that. Jesus didn't keep any secrets from the disciples. He said, but whatever the father openly shares with me, I share with you. It was complete openness, transparency. He shared all with them. He goes on to verse 16 and he says, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you would go and bear fruit and that your fruit would remain so that whatever you ask in the, um, of the Father in my name, he may give to you. This I command you, that you love one another. This section of scripture was to encourage them, to remind them, to exhort them. And he closes this section in the relationships with each other by reminding them of a very, very powerful truth that he chose them. In this section, he had spoke about beautiful blessings and privileges that they had as disciples. Friendship with the master, no longer servants, but friends. The assurance of answered prayer, bearing fruit as we abide in him. Knowing secrets from the Father. All these amazing things, but having all these blessings, it might have caused the disciples, it might cause us to get puffed up, to think, wow, look at all this that I have. We might have thought that we earned it on our own merits, on our own accord. And so he reminds them and he reminds us these blessings come only by the simple fact that God chose us. Now, this idea of a rabbi and teacher choosing, this was foreign to these disciples at this time. What was common practice was if you wanted to uh, learn, you would... It, 
watch a, a rabbi and a teacher and one that you really, really admired, you'd begin to follow him. You would choose him and he would pour into you. And so here Jesus is, the teacher and the rabbi saying, no, you didn't choose me. I chose you. He shared this with them to bring comfort, encourage them, that they would continue the work as he was getting ready to leave them. And Jesus choosing the disciples was a blessing to them. And it also reminds us and shows us of the same way that he chose us to be his children. And that should bless each and every single one of us. The same comfort and blessing it brought them, it should bring us that Jesus, that God chose you. If you have your own Bible, highlight that and circle it. Because at times when you feel discouraged, and even if you don't have your Bible, if you're using the churches, it's okay, circle it. Somebody needs to open up and say, God chose you. There's some of you guys on the playground, you're still scorned because you were always last to be picked. Not in God's house, he chose you. Before the foundations of the earth, he picked you. He chose you. He was mindful of you. It's so exciting. When did God choose the disciples? When did he choose us? Ephesians chapter 1 verse 4 says that God has chosen us in Christ before the foundations of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him. He chose you before the foundations of the earth. He chose you. In Ephesians chapter 1, it's a beautiful section of scriptures. And it begins with Paul listing all these amazing blessings that he had been blessed with and received in Christ. But at the top of that list, before he covers everything else, the top of the Apostle Paul's list was the fact that God had chose him. And it was at the top of his list, but I believe that it should also be on the top of our list. We have so many blessings that God has bestowed upon us and we can list them and go all night long talking about them, but but they're nothing if we don't just start with the simple fact that God chose us. Jesus said in John chapter six, no one comes to him unless they're first drawn by the father. A lot of people have a problem with this choosing, with predestination. With the fact that God chooses. The Bible teaches that very, very clearly. So the question is, is it fair? Of course it is. God makes his choices on the basis of the fact that he knows everything. He has foreknowledge. Romans 8, 29 says, For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become the image of his son. So God knowing He knows everything. He knew who would respond to his love, who would respond to his call and his grace, and he chose them on that basis. This wasn't random selection. Oh, this, this, that, no, this, that. No, it wasn't that. This was based on whom he foreknew. He predestined. He knew that we would choose him. He chose us and we chose him. What was this? What did he choose these disciples for here specifically? It says that they would go and bear fruit. And that their fruit should remain. And so Jesus chose the disciples, not that they would just sit around. Not that they would do nothing, but they would be about their father's business. He didn't just choose them that they would just be the frozen chosen. You guys are chosen and you're, you're special. Just sit around and do nothing. No, he said that you would go and bear fruit for the glory of God. Fruit that truly lasts. Lasting. Making disciples. Discipling and furthering the kingdom of God and building the church. That was the work that he called them for. But that same call is on us as well today. It has nothing to do about special credentials or or titles. Jesus has appointed you. He's appointed me and, and all of us to go and to bear fruit and to be about his work. So the question we have to ask ourselves tonight are, are we bearing fruit for the kingdom of God? What are we doing that's bearing fruit? He says, go. He told the disciples to go and make lasting fruit. But before we can think about bearing fruit within our ministry, we have to focus on making sure that we're bearing fruit in our lives spiritually. Fruits of the spirit. That's what he talked about abiding. In verses one through 11, God cares more about the minister than the ministry. Before we go out and we're doing, 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 we've got to make sure that we're producing fruit. So the spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, self-control, these things, that we're bearing those things. And he closes and says, this command I've given you. He starts and ends with it with go and love one another. 
The rest of the chapter, which we'll take a look at next week, focuses on the hate that the disciples will receive from the world, how they'll be received. And so before he talks about the hate, the tough times, the things that were to come, he encouraged them to stick together, to stay united, and to love one another. What a great message for us here tonight. And so in closing, let's memorize and let's practice this commandment to truly love one another. Let's pray that God would show us that we would have a heart to lay down our lives for those who we love. And be reminded and encouraged, those who are closest to Jesus, who have the closest friendship with Jesus, are those who are the most obedient. And remember, God has called us and appointed us to bear fruit, lasting fruit. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much just for your word and for your goodness and your grace in this place here tonight, Lord. God, I I pray even now, Lord, that we would just begin to just be in awe of you and your plan for us, the fact that you chose us. God, the fact that you gave us an amazing command to love one another, it's difficult, but God, what an amazing command. Lord, we want to be obedient. Lord, we want to be obedient to that call. And so, Lord, fill each one with a great, great, great measure of your Holy Spirit to fulfill those things that you've called us to do. And so, Lord, we just ask that we would be serious about the call that you've placed on our life to bear fruit, lasting fruit, that we'd be those branches that are abiding in the vine, Lord, as we abide in you and you and us, we'll produce fruit, Lord. We don't have to do nothing. We just got to abide, to remain, to stay close and to press into you. And you produce the fruit, Lord. And so God, just bless us, Lord. Pour out your spirit upon this time as we enter our baptism service, Lord. May your spirit be here, moving powerfully and mightily. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Amen.